Winter in Dubuque usually means a lot of snow, and it's up to the Public Works Department to clear the roads to keep traffic moving. Hi, I'm Randy Gale, and on this edition of City Journal, we're going to look at snow and ice control to see how the city prepares for winter road conditions. To discuss this today, I'm joined by John Klosterman and Renee Tyler from the Public Works Department. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Renee, let's start with you and, and let's talk about some numbers. Um, what's the city's annual budget just for snow and ice control? So our budget is approximately $1.5 million. Now the majority of that is comprised of our maintenance, salt, and our employees. Okay. And <clears throat> how many miles of streets does the city uh, have to clear snow and ice from? So, as you know, our city is made up of centerline miles. So, the centerline miles for the city of Dubuque are 280. However, when we are, we are plowing, we are doing streets and lanes. So, we plow approximately 600 miles when we do snow and ice removal. Wow, that's, uh, that puts it into perspective for a lot of yes. people, I think. Um, John, let's talk about uh, kind of a department-wide approach. How does the Public Works Department prepare when a, a storm is predicted or forecast? You know, we start looking at long-range forecasts, usually a 15-day outlook, and then we start to pare down from there. Uh, three days, weekend, you know. Our best forecast always comes in 24 hours ahead of time. So that's when they really start to make the final decisions. Uh, we have a forecast center that provides us a daily forecast and it's updated throughout the day if needed um, a couple times a day. We use all resources that are out there. Everybody has their favorite uh, that we go to and, and you know our employees uh, keep us up on what they like and what they're hearing. So we kind of have this, uh, this uh, discussion every morning on maybe what we're looking at. So once we kind of pare that down, decide we get closer to the storm, and we start looking at what type of event it's going to be, whether or not it's going to be snow, will it be rain, will it be freezing rain, what are the pavement temps and what that's going to do, you know, the type of precip and, and how that affects pavement temps because that's really what we're concerned with. So we put all that information together and then we start to do a plan and because every storm has its own personality, we do that for every storm. Mm -hmm. So uh, while a lot of things are the same, uh, you know, some things that we need to look at is, you know, the tools that we use. Is anti-icing the right tool that we're going to use this time? And that'll change based on pavement temperatures or the type of storm we're going to get. So one time anti-icing may be the proper tool, and the next time it may not. So then we'll, uh, we'll look at that. So once we look at tools and decide how we're going to do it, then we look at precipitation timing and whether or not, when that it's going to start, whether we have to adjust our, our shift, that our sign, regular shifts, or... We change those a little bit up so we have the people in the right place at the right time. And speaking of tools, how do you use technology to prepare for these conditions? Well, technology's changed a lot over the years, you know, and we now able to receive those forecasts. Uh, used to come from a telephone that they would call you and you'd do a checklist and, and that's how you'd receive it. Now, of course, it's available on the internet, uh, provides it to us. Updates are, are sent, uh, notices are sent by you know, phone and we receive those either through text or we receive it, you know, through an email, however we want to receive those. Our notifications are received that way. We provide our staff with access to those uh, at, in our strategy room and they also, we also have uh, internet access and then we also have a satellite in which we can pick up that type of information also. Okay. And so that's how the, the staff uses it, or how it's used internally. What about the public? How does it benefit from the technology that you're using? Uh, yeah. So there's a couple ways that technology helps the public out, and that's in the interactive snowplow map, of course, that we have. And there's a link at our website, citydebuteorg slash snow. And when they go to that, there's a link that will take them right to a progress map that will show where the plows have been and how long ago it's been plowed. And, and it's a quick way to, to see if the plows are out, maybe your best route, uh, one that you use every day might not be the best based on the storm, you'll be able to pick a different one. So um, the other way to do it is notify me, of course, uh, when we do declare different uh, snow, mostly our odd even program, uh, you can receive those notices so you're up to date on the current information. Renee, uh, when we get a significant snowfall, uh, that presents some real challenges in the downtown area where there's not a lot of room to, to put all that snow mm -hmm. up from the streets. Um, 
what does the Public Works Department do with that snow when they have to actually clear it? Well, we, we take the snow to the South Port currently, so that's where the excess snow is stored. Okay. And what about, uh, what, what are the different types of equipment the, the department uses to remove snow? I know there's, you have a number of tools in your arsenal, as mm -hmm. John talked about, but when you get down to different pieces of equipment, what are we talking about? Well, we have approximately 24 pieces of equipment that um, can be used for snow plowing and operations removal. An example is our snow glow. So this is um, it's a, a piece of equipment that can be quickly mounted onto an end loader and it's then used to go taken into downtown or wherever throughout the city to remove the snow. Um, that snow is then placed on our tandem axle dump trucks and hauled over to the Southport. So one of the um, newest additions to our fleet is a CNG tandem, which is a, it functions as a plow as well as a dump truck. It is also the very first CNG snow plow for the state of Iowa. Um, in addition to that, we do have other uh, in loaders, graders that can be medium and heavy duty that can be quickly converted into snow removal um, pieces of equipment. And for our viewers who might not know what CNG stands for, it's oh, a new term that's here, right, that's right. Term. So CNG is compressed natural gas. Um, it's a clean fuel. It burns clean. It also maintains a, a more uh, a cleaner engine. Um, so we. We are looking at less maintenance um, and just, you know, a more efficient way to operate our fleet. So, Renee, some of our viewers may be watching thinking, you know, what can I do to help maybe expedite this process? Mm. As, as we know, uh, everyone wants their street cleared as quickly as possible. Right. What are some small things that, that the average resident can do that can help, help you do your job? First and foremost, we ask that when, uh, in an, when an impending event is coming, please move your cars from the busy thoroughfares. You know, we cannot clean the streets adequately when we have cars there. Um, as John had mentioned early, earlier, Notify Me. Notify Me will update any citizen as to what the progress is, what we're doing. Um, as our plans change, if there are any shifts in the storm, they can get access to that information immediately via their smartphone. Um, and I think the other thing that we need to let people know is we ask that they not shovel or blow snow into the street. This causes hazards, you know, um, from driving, walking, whatever. So if, if we can get citizens to work with us on those points, it would be most helpful. It makes a big difference in our ability to remove the snow, well, to plow and to remove the snow and ice. And your, your ultimate goal is always to clear that roadway from curb to curb. But, that is correct. You, know, you make those first few passes to get the, the, lane, the traffic lanes passable, but then it's always nice to get right. them cleared. And you, you A nice can't, clear can't street. You can't do that without cars, when car, cars, are, cars are parked there. That's right. Uh, John, let's talk a little bit more about budgeting. Uh, what goes into budgeting for snow and ice control? Well, budgeting, <coughs> you know, with any year is, is based on previous years. Now, if we have a series of light years, and we'll, then we'll go back further and try to get a true average. Uh, uh, been kind of recent uh, light, so this year we looked at a five year instead of a three year. Sometimes we'll use three years if it comes in pretty average. So uh, those are the things we look at. The biggest areas of the change, you know, a lot of the employee expenses is already set due to contracts. Um, and by formula, so that's, but we take a hard look at material purchases, especially with our salt, it's a big dollar item, usually over 300,000 a year. Um, and there's, we look at what we have in stock from the last year, and then we look at what we think we'll need in the future. Now we're doing these budgets a year and a half ahead of time, so the likelihood that we'll be 100% probably isn't uh, uh, too good. So, you know, one way we'll be over, one way we'll be under, but. We want to be real close to where we're at, and we do that by doing budgeting, by averaging budgeting. And everything we've talked about so far is focused on uh, city staff and city equipment used for snow and ice control. What about private contractors? Do, do they play a role in the process occasionally, or how do, you, uh, how do you prepare for that variable? 
They do play a role, not so much with the public works operation, but with the total snow city uh, operation. Uh, private contractors are used to maintain, help help us assist in the maintenance of the private of the city lots, uh, parking lots, and the ramps. Uh, snow has to be removed from the top of the ramps. Things we don't think about, but uh, uh, we ask for assistance on that. On the public works side, we do in major snow events. Uh, we will rely on contractors to assist in removal in the downtown area. Uh, in extreme cases, we would ask them also to assist on removal in other areas, but uh, uh, we only do that in extreme cases. Uh, most of the time, we're doing it with all city staff. Okay. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, but uh, we all have our favorite uh, source for weather information or favorite forecasters. Uh, what tools do you use specifically when it comes to forecasting weather? Yeah, so we we have our consulting service that provides us with the with the daily updates. Um, also, with that, it's unique because they're they're a consulting service that is specifically looking at things that we want. So things that we don't get from the National Weather Service would be pavement temperature, dew point um, uh, is another thing that we look at uh, whether or not we want to anti ice or or do things like that, but. Um, and then we have a consulting, we're able to consult with them throughout the storm. They're available 24 hours a day. We can just send them a question and they'll respond back in a fairly short period, five minutes or so. So we can get those updates as we need them. As we know with forecasts, um, sometimes they always don't come together like we think. And, and we see that a lot in winter operations. And I think all fo forecasters will say that. That's why the, the most recent forecasts are within that 24 hour period is where we're gonna get our best forecasts. John, a couple of years ago when we did this program, uh, you gave us a demonstration of that forecasting software that you use. So uh, let's take a look at that again as a refresher. Well, we're at the Municipal Services Center, which is the home office for the Public Works Department, and we're in the strategy room. And this is where we meet uh, both prior to storms and throughout the storm, where we, where we look at the technology that we have available to us, forecasting services, We'll meet with crews in this area and uh, we'll review the information that we have and the strategies that we'll take going into the storm. There's two ways that we receive information for um, our forecasts. We, re we have a paid forecast service that provides us 24 hour day, seven days a week forecasts. Um, they also provide and a way that we can communicate them with them directly through uh, emails, basically emails or a post. Um, we also have a, a service, an alert service that they provide us. And what they'll do is provide, call us uh, four to five hours ahead of the storm um, and put us into a warning. That will give us time to uh, prepare and uh, they'll give us their thoughts on the upcoming storm. We have two different systems in, in, in the strategy room. One is the satellite system where we receive the feed and the information through a satellite which is up on the roof. Um, what that allows crew members to do throughout the storm, throughout the night, we leave this area open as they come down, refuel, uh, stock up their uh, salt supply, reload their truck. They're also able to come in and look, take a quick look at the uh, radar and try to predict on what action they'll take once they leave. If it's toward the end of the storm, they'll make their final runs probably through primary and secondary streets. Uh, if they're, if they, and then look to move into the residential areas. If they see that the radar and the storm's gonna be around for a while, then they'll probably uh, concentrate more on the primary and secondary streets. So that service is available to all our crew members. Uh, we also have a secondary service which uh, is a web-based service and not all of our employees have access to the web so that's why we provide both services. Uh, the advantage of the web base, of course I can get that same information whether I'm at home or, or out in the field through uh, smartphones and, and tablets. So it's a, it's a great service for us also. Uh, both are, are through the same company. Um, now we also we start to look at the forecasts you know, three, four, five days out, kind of look at a week. 
Um, our forecast service actually provides us with a 15-day outlook. So we'll go to that quite often now, of course. A lot of times, the further out you go, the, the greater chance that that forecast will be revised throughout the week. But it gives us something, you know, puts it in our mind that this is, this is a possibility that's out there. So we, we look at that um, quite often throughout the week because that, that, that will change quite a bit. They also provide us with an hourly forecast, which is updated as needed throughout the day. And the things that we look at, probably more than what the average person looks at, would be um, the bridge temperatures and the pavement temperatures. That's basically how we provide and, and make decisions on, on what levels of service we'll provide, whether we go out and anti-ice and, and spray liquids ahead of the storm, um, whether or not we'll go out at, as soon as it starts to snow, uh, pavement temps are near or above freezing, and then of course we're not going to go out and apply any uh, materials until we feel that it's necessary. So we watch the, the pavement and bridge temperatures are a big area that we look at and we keep a constant track of that as the storm uh, grows nearer. One of the features of course uh, that we just talked about was the radar that goes along with this service and there's several layers that we can just add to that. Um, we have the radar up now, but we can add uh, pavement conditions. So throughout the state, we can quickly see uh, what's going on throughout the state. You can see some of the areas, uh, even today, are, are looking at some ice. And what that is, is taking information that they've, uh, uh, in most cases, are weather stations and, and pucks that are in the pavement, and they'll take that information and then determine whether it's wet or, or if the pavement's wet or dry or if chemicals been applied. And you just uh, kind of look at that to give you a real quick picture of what's going on throughout the state. Most of our storms are go west to east, so we have a chance to look at western Iowa, see what's going on, and then um, we know that within a certain amount of time we'll be seeing most of the time same type of conditions. Another layer that we like to use, of course, are the pavement temperatures. We can add those to the radar and overlay that on the screen. So we'll get bridge and pavement temperatures at the areas where those are available. Once again, we normally will start to look at uh, forecasts that long term for a week and then we really start uh, making decisions 12 to 24 hours, 36 hours ahead of the storm. In this case, we're looking at a, a storm that may be coming in over the weekend, so we're making plans now. Uh, some of the action steps that we have, we're out doing some anti-icing strategies going on right now. We've also looked at our crew assignments for the weekends and, and how we're gonna start next week off. This particular case, we're looking at a storm starting on Sunday afternoon. We feel that's on carry over into Monday morning. So we've already assigned a shift to come in at midnight on Sunday, Sunday night, Monday morning. So we have that continuous uh, um, coverage in place. So this is all information that we gather and we bring together and, and we come up with our plan and we use all the tools available. Once again, we love the web-based uh, service because that's readily available. I don't have to be in the in this strategy room to gather that information. I can get it on a lot of different uh, tools, you know, our smartphones, our pads, the iPads that we have, and then of course we could also get it on any computer that would have internet access. We just want to, another tool that we have available in the strategy room here, and it's not available to us on the web at this time, but that's the cameras that are normally used for traffic. Uh, intersections. We've taken those and we've uh, redirected that feed down to the Municipal Services Center and we have that up on a monitor ahead of, uh, a monitor here at the uh, uh, Municipal Services Center. That's really critical what at the start of the storm so we know what's going on throughout the whole city and we're basically, all we're looking at is, is the pavements. Are the pavements starting to cover? Is the traffic starting to slow down? Those type of things. 
and that saves us from sending out spotter trucks. Years in the past, we used to send out spotter trucks to different areas, and they'd drive around and kind of radio back on how, how things are looking throughout the city because different areas of the city, the payment temps change a little bit, drop a little bit. That makes a difference uh, throughout uh, our action plan. So uh, this feed, of course, is not, the cameras are not basically set up for snow and ice control. We're just taking advantage, full advantage of a system that's already in place, diverting that information to another uh, uh, use, basically. Another tool that we have for snow and ice control is our automated vehicle location system, or AVL, which we commonly call. It allows us to monitor locations of our trucks, monitor the spread rate or the material rate that they're using, and then also plow location, either up or down. And that's critical to us as we look for different ways to reduce the amount of chemicals that we use on the streets and still provide the same level of service um, that, that we want to achieve. Um, right now you can see there's some trucks out because we use, while this is not a snow operation going on right now, there are trucks out in the field and we use the same equipment both for snow and ice control and for other things like street cleaning or street maintenance. That's all the same type of equipment. So you can see that we have some, some equipment out on the street right now. During a winter event, we we would lock, we could uh, isolate on one of those trucks, and we could see where they're at, see what unit number it is. We could also show the details on what we would be monitoring at the time. Um, like I said, spread rate is is the biggest thing that we look for to make sure that um, everybody's all on the same page when we go over at the start of the storm that um, everybody, everything is clear that we're putting down the same amount of material on all the routes and, and we base that on recommendations from the Federal Highway um, Program. So their, their spread rates, while they have to be adjusted for the storm and that's why we let the drivers make those decisions, but basically we want everybody kind of in that same area. We don't want to make decisions here in the office without seeing the conditions that the driver is making, uh, can see out on the street. So they have to have that ability to be able to adjust those rates and adjust their uh, strategies as they go. Um, we just look at material rates and see if, if they fall within the parameters of what we feel. If we feel that, you know, maybe uh, it's been switched or something and, and if we have a question on it, all we have to do is call the truck, the operator, and he'll respond back. He'll either adjust it or else he'll explain why he's, what he's seeing out there. We started this system back in 2006. We did it on a, on, on a, a small scale as we started to just investigate um, the use of AVL. And then now we build it up to the point where we have on all our snow equipment plus our heavy equipment also. So, and that's important to us because when we go over in, uh, 2013, January th 2013, we started a public site on, on plowing information, and that's our snow plow progress map. And real quickly, I even use this uh, to look and see how things are going throughout the city. While it's a, it has a different uh, view, it does show where streets have been plowed and and the plows, where the plows have been and also where they still need to go. So um, that's available to the public. Anybody with access to the internet can go to the cityofdubuque.org slash snow page and they can pick that up um, and view that at any time. These are the tools that we have available to us. Um, we use them both here at the Municipal Services Center and also at our homes or, or wherever we may be. Uh, they're uh, readily available to all our crew members, so we want to make sure that you know it's available to them. They have the same information uh, we have, so that they can make smart decisions out on the street. That system's been in place for a number of years. We've had updates to that. We've added the camera system that we can monitor pavements to, but uh, pretty much that's the same uh, software system and, and, and the available tools that we have as 
that's where it's going. Okay. And you mentioned salt a minute ago. Um, how do you plan to make sure the city has a, an adequate supply of salt, but not too much on hand? Uh, so how do you how do you plan for that? Yeah. So we've after oh, it's probably oh seven, maybe even before that. You know, salt supply's got there's always enough of salt, but it's based on the winter you're having, whether or not it's available in your area. And if you get into a position where you're running low on salt, uh, of course the price of that product comes up because they have to bring it in. For, you're not the only one looking for it, so they have to bring it in for the transportation costs. So what we've decided back in a uh, number of years ago is that we were going to start the winter out with 12,000 ton purchased and available for use by the city of Dubuque. So we purchased that. And that's our goal every year. So we look at that, we see what we've had left over from the year before, and that'll determine what we order. Now we, we order salt by going out to bid to the major salt uh, suppliers. And then we make that agreement and they'll bring it up by barge throughout the summer and we'll unload it on our stockpile. And by November 1st, we want it in place, we want to have as close to 12,000 ton. Now that'll vary depending on the amount of salt they put on the barge. So uh, our goal is to have 12,000 ton of salt available each year at the start of each winter. Our average is only about 7,000 ton of salt, but we also want to cover those extreme winters. So once again, we want to buy it when it's uh, at its best price and we want to have that available when we need it. Okay. And Renee, John mentioned uh, barge, the salt comes on a barge, so uh, tell our viewers where the salt comes from and mm -hmm. he also mentioned a stockpile, maybe walk us through the process of where it comes from, what happens to it once it gets here before it's applied to the streets. So I think, I think it's pretty interesting. The salt actually is purchased from salt mines in Louisiana, um, as John mentioned. It then is transported up the Mississippi on barge to our Purina uh, drive location. Once it gets there, it's unloaded. They use conveyors and it's very interesting to watch it because the, you have the conveyors and they're unloading the salt from the barge, putting it into the Perina Drive location. Um, as John mentioned, that's our main place that it's uh, stored. It's covered in the winter time uh, with a plastic tarp. Now, we also maintain a second location at the Municipal Services Center. It's a dome salt storage building, a smaller, smaller building. It holds 1,500 ton of salt. So all the blending and mixing and that type of thing, which is taking place over at Municipal Services Center, it's done using that salt from that dome. And we try to maintain you know, the 1,500 ton at all times, especially during an event because you don't want to run out of salt. So that's that's the process, okay. yeah. Okay. And John, when you talk about prioritizing um, snow and ice control operations, I know you, you, you have primary routes and secondary routes. Can you explain to our viewers what what qualifies as a primary route, what's a secondary route, kind of how, how you work your way through that prioritization process? Because we have limited staff and limited resources, we have to determine, you know, <coughs> what areas are going to best be served and how we move traffic the furthest, the best way to do it. So it's set up as a primary street, secondary streets, and residential streets is our, is our program. Very similar to what everybody does in the snow belt. Uh, it's all based on traffic flow. So primary streets would be the heaviest traveled streets. Secondary streets are usually to a destination, uh, similar to a school or somewhere like that, um, off of the, connected to us, a primary street. And then the, the remainder of the streets are in the residential areas where we live. Okay. And, and those actual designations are, are really based on uh, traffic counts, I assume, or how do you make those determinations? What's primary, secondary? Yeah, primary streets are all based on uh, our traffic counts, okay. the heaviest roads. Yeah. Been. And it's kind of like a feeder system. So, you know, we get those open, traffic can move. We'll get you as close as we can to your home using primary and secondary streets. You may have to travel ways, you know, to get to your actual home uh, throughout the storm. So pavement conditions will change. So during the storm, our trucks are, are focused on primary and secondary streets. Um, so they may be in better shape 
than what your residential street is. Hopefully you won't have to go too far on that residential street to, to get home. And then we'll finish up in the residential areas after the storm is over. And we talked earlier about uh, you know, nearly 300 centerline miles of streets that, that the city maintains, but there are some, some roadways within the city limits <coughs> that the Iowa Department of Transportation is responsible for. Can you tell our viewers what some of those roadways are? The roadways that are maintained by the Iowa DOT include what we call Dodge Street or Highway 20 West. It would also include 151, 61 as you head up over to uh, Wisconsin. So those are the main drags that are maintained by Iowa DOT. There's some streets that are uh, federal highway streets um, throughout the city that are, that are actually the city under contract with Iowa DOT, like a central and white. We pick those up, uh, we get paid by the lane mile, but we actually do the maintenance on that for snow and ice control. Okay. Renee, uh, John talked a little earlier about uh, preparing for a storm and staffing. Mm -hmm. um, what type of shifts do public work staff work during a storm, during an event? So Randy, you know, it is our, our intent, we are going to provide continuous coverage during an event. So in order to do that, we run two 12 hour shifts. Um, Nonstop, our guys will work until the event is done. Uh, I know previously, uh, there was one year, they worked for what, a couple of months. It was, they got Christmas off. Mm -hmm. So they're very dedicated, but they will work until the event is done. Okay. And I think it's important to know that the work doesn't necessarily end when the storm ends. So a typical storm with four or five inches accumulation, doesn't happen every time, but uh, they'll finish the routes. We'll come in and do a quick change on the equipment because we use the same equipment to do both uh, plowing, the icing, and removal. So we'll do that and then we'll move into the downtown area. Now the removal process may take equally as long as the plowing or longer. Uh, Renee had uh, talked about uh, an incident back in 2007, 2008, where we had our record-breaking snowfall and we went for the whole month of December and removal 24-hour operation seven days a week. Uh, and then, it, uh, which was a great thing because we didn't know it at the time, but February was a record-breaking month for snowfall. So it's all about creating space sometimes for future events that may or may not come. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Uh, now, Renee, Dubuque's terrain uh, presents some challenges uh, in for lots of operations that public works has to do, but especially for snow and ice control. Mm -hmm. What role does our terrain play in, in your operations? Well, as you know, Dubuque has a lot of hills and narrow streets. Um, and the fact that we have hills and narrow streets, it actually fuels our mission to get these streets cleared. Um, so there are times where, you know, we have to go back or work through it um, to get things done. And that's also another reason why people, it, it helps when they move their cars. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, and speaking of moving cars, John, that's a perfect segue for our, our next topic, uh, our, our snow route, our odd even snow route parking policy. Um, tell our viewers a little bit about that. Maybe we have some people who are new to the community that aren't familiar with it and lots of communities do it differently, but how do we do it here in Dubuque? Well, our odd even program is the only parking program that we have related strictly to snow and ice control. Now in the downtown area, we have uh, posted signage for snow and ice control and also for uh, sweeping and any other type of maintenance, but that's, that's all year long. Uh, odd even program is only for snow and ice control operation. It's only one declared. It's only on the signed uh, streets. So on some of our, on most, a lot of our major arterials, we have signs out into the area. Now the program could be based on where it's at, could be from one in the morning until five in the morning, or it could be from noon until 5 p.m. So it's really important that um, our residents and, and our driving public actually uh, be aware of this program. Uh, the signs are out there, but it's only in force when it is declared. Uh, another great reason to have notify me because those are the things that come up during major storms. Uh, we have a snow emergency policy, but 
uh, very seldom is that ever declared. Uh, we work through those other issues. So unlike a snow emergency that a lot of cities will call where all of a sudden we remove everybody from the streets, we realize that a lot of areas that we have, we don't have that off street parking option. So this was an option that we looked at. It's really an after event. So we'll finish all our plowing operations, we'll all our de-icing operations, and then, then usually within 24 hours, we'll start to announce that odd even program. And we do that in a number of different ways. Uh, we have our uh, code red pro uh, call-in program that we, that we send out automatic notifications if you sign up for that. We have our notify me is another great way of doing that. Um, so a number of different ways, and of course, then we use a, the the media to get that notice out mm -hmm. also. Yeah, so again, it's important that people be aware whether they live on a odd even snow route or they maybe park there for work. Again, watch for those signs. And, and, and you're right, there's lots of ways to, to stay updated on when that's uh, enacted, including social media, the city's social media channels too. Uh, so those are really, as we talked about before, anyone who can get their car off their street is going to help you do your job in clearing that, that street. But the odd even routes are where people have to get them off when that policy is, is announced so that those primary routes can be cleared curb to curb. So one question that we, we sometimes get about the policy is, you know, the, the sign says when the policy, what the hours of the policy uh, in effect are. However, if a plow goes through, people may say, well, now can I park back there? Even though the, the time frame is, we're still within that time window, can I move my car back? How do you respond to those kind of questions about when people can park back on the area? It's really important that they pay attention to the signs and that they follow the, what the sign says. So it's, it's in enforcement, regardless if the plow went through or not, from the time uh, it states on the sign until it ends. So throughout the whole period, there's no parking throughout that. And the reason for that is really because it, there's no way we can enforce it, what we found out. You know, there's a lot of confusion when you can park, when you can't park. Easiest way is just no parking throughout that time period that it says. And in fact, your staff may need to make multiple passes. Whereas if a plow goes through once, they're gonna they may be coming back to clear that a little better. So that, that's why that entire window they need to stay off it. They may the we window. may have to do other things. Uh, sometimes they get delayed uh, throughout the storm. Sometimes they're able, there's no there's no cars there at the time. So maybe that snow gets pushed back, but yet there's another spot where there's parking throughout. So um, in order to make for a, just a clean program, it's just very important that they follow the signs and restrict that parking throughout that period. And if people do have questions about the policy, is that, are those questions, uh, should they be referred to your department or the police department? Because I know the police department handles enforcement of that, correct? Exactly. So if it's a, if it's a question about the parking program itself, we gladly take that call or, or any questions um, Related to that, if it if it concerns enforcement, then that'd be a police issue, and they would take those calls. And John, something relatively new uh, to our community are modern traffic roundabouts. Um, the, the first one that was completed at the uh, Grandview, Delhi, and Gray Street intersection, uh, a very complicated intersection. Um, and, and the city's looking at installing more roundabouts. So, how does your department deal with clearing snow and ice? Uh, from roundabouts as opposed to the traditional uh, intersection that was there. Well, uh, that was a that was a question when we looked at this. You know, how how are we going to maintain this? And we knew what we had there before. A wide open intersection uh, required several passes in order to open that up. Um, sometimes uh, required to plow the back up, which is not the preferred way to go in a high traffic area like that. So we looked at the design, we had our input on it, uh, and as it turned out, it's a much easier intersection to plow when it comes to snow and ice control. They'll make a couple passes around it, uh, we'll plow it out away from the roundabout, and then we'll open up the cross section. So it's, uh, for us, in this particular case, it's a much better scenario for us to plow and maintain that intersection now with the roundabout than what it was when it was wide open intersection. Renee, you mentioned that um, one of the things residents can do to help is not blow or uh, shovel snow out into the streets. 
Uh, not only does it negate the work that your staff is doing to clear the streets, it can create some hazards as well. So mm -hmm. tell our viewers a little bit more about the, the city's ordinance in relation to uh, putting snow or ice out into the street. Well, you know, as we mentioned before, blowing snow um, and moving snow into the street is illegal um, due to the fact it does cost, ad cause additional safety concerns and hazards. So it's illegal. That That's basically okay. it. Yeah. And so we encourage residents to, to pile that snow on their, on their property. Put it on their property, or, yeah. yeah. Um, and we realize that that might not be the most convenient thing, but it's better than inconveniencing all of their neighbors and, and any other citizens that are using that street. Okay. All right, well, thank you both for, for taking the time to, to talk to us about this uh, critical activity, really, um, this time of year to make sure people can get to work, uh, that emergency uh, responders can get to the incidents that they need to get to, and we can just uh, continue to, <laughs> to live uh, in, here in the snow belt. So thanks for all you do. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for having us. And thank you for watching City Channel Dubuque.